Thank you, Nilo, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I know this is the first talk after the last night happy hour. I'll try to make it fun. Uh, so today I want to talk about like Keepster, this system we put together to analyze um, dynamical locators for monolithic firmware images. Um, let's try to break down the title, first of all. Um, a dynamical locator uh, is like an algorithm that used to uh, manage dynamic memory, in other words, like the heap memory uh, of programs. And a robust dynamic allocator algorithm is crucial for the performance of any software. Um, it's usually composed by at least two primitives, uh, malloc and free, that we're going to call, like for this talk, the heap management library, in other, in other, like, in a, with an acronym HML. Um, dynamic allocators are like routinely abused uh, as a building blocks of complex exploitation chains. Uh, for example, like at pwn to one we can see many times like uh, heap-based buffer overflow being used to uh, mount like remote code execution uh, exploits. Um, yeah, for different targets. So uh, routers like Zoom, like Chrome, like any target, like at some point in the chain there is like a um, heap-based vulnerability. Um, researchers from both academia and industry have been tackling this for a while. So they've been studying the security of dynamic allocators for like a few years at this point. And we, as like a community, we came up with um, different like solutions. Like the, one of the first solution was like heap hopper. So symbolic like reasoning about um, the state of the heap and how we can put the heap in a corrupted state. Um, other like um, research teams, they came up with like a fuzzing technique in order to explore the state um, of the heap libraries and put them in like, again, a vulnerable or corrupted state. Um, people also came up with techniques in order to uh, understand how to manipulate the heap layout in memory to, uh, this is also known as like heap feng shui uh, for the CTF players. Um, and yeah, to understand automatically how to uh, reach a specific uh, memory layout to create like an exploit. And finally, there are many, many um, suggestions for like safer implementations, um, both from like industry and like academia again. And but most of the research has been done targeting classic systems, so desktop systems and the normal libc you have in your laptop. Uh, while the research for embedded system, like it's not as like um, like there is not a lot of research being done for like embedded systems. Um, on the other side, like the monolithic firmware image is a firmware image uh, without a uh, noS abstraction. So um, on the left, you can see like a monolithic firmware image in which you have like a blob, like a, a big binary like uh, that contains everything, the operating system, the libraries or the, and the application that runs uh, that perform like the functionality of the uh, device. On the other side, on the right side, you can see instead like a classic system in which there is like a very clear, uh, separation between all the layers. So the app are like talking with the operating system through like specific APIs, and then you have specific APIs to, to talk with the hardware. So everything is clean and nice. This is not the case like for monolithic firmware images. Um, turns out that they empower a huge amount of diverse IoT devices. And this means that the uh, attack surface out there is very huge. And there is a spectrum of different threat scenarios um, that they go from well, I just hack my toaster, which is not a big deal usually, um, to, well, I got a remote arbitrary write over a pacemaker, which is actually a big deal. Um, this is like notoriously a very hard target for both static and dynamic analysis because you are on your own with like a binary only and usually very few information about where the binary is coming from. Uh, you don't have symbols and you don't have the hardware to run the, this monolithic firmware. So, and sometimes you don't even know what is the hardware supposed to uh, run this like binary. And finally, if you want to do like large scale analysis um, of like many firmware images of this kind, rehosting technologies are like kind of behind. Um, so, it's very difficult to uh, use like a rehosting technology to uh, emulate, fully emulate all this firmware. So um, for this like research, we want to put together like the world of dynamic allocators and the world of monolithic firmware and see what's in the middle. Uh, the first question is, can we understand if a binary, uh, if a firmware binary is using a dynamic allocator at all? And can we check if the firmware allocator is robust against like known attacks? So these are like the research questions we explore in, uh, in this paper. Um, just to define a little bit the resource scope, uh, because when we talk about firmware, the domain is too broad. Uh, so we, we had to uh, confine a little bit what we are trying to do. 
so we want, again, monolithic firmware images for Cortex M CPUs because it's one of the uh, most spread architecture for IoT devices. And in particular, like um, we are looking for firmware that are using classic dynamic allocators. So that are you know, like working like the normal malloc you probably like guys know. Uh, so usually you ask for a specific size for a chunk you want in memory. At least like uh, size must be one of the parameter of the of the malloc. Um, they return the address that they just allocated inside a register. So for example, in ARM, you're going to return it to R0. And at some point, they try to exploit opportunities to reallocate over deallocated chunk. So if I deallocate a chunk, at some point, I expect this address to appear again in memory to be reused. So this is our like uh, research scope. And that being said, we put together like hipster. Uh, these are like the main steps of the uh, of the system. We receive like a firmware image, like an unknown firmware image. We don't know anything about besides the fact it's for Cortex M. And the first step is we identify the basic functions, which are functions that are like manipulating like pointers in some way, copying like memory or comparing memory. Then we want to identify the pointer sources, so functions that are returning pointers, crafting like in other words these pointers. Then we go to identifying the HML, the heap management library, and finally we want to check the security. We are going to dive in in all these steps like um, in the next few slides. So I said we receive like a binary image. We don't know anything, just bunch of one and zeros. Um, seems pretty scary. But the first thing we do is to try to recognize the function boundaries inside the firmware. So to do this, we um, reuse some uh, state of the art technique, uh, recursive disassembly and like pattern matching, like prologues of functions. And so we go uh, to this situation where we have like bunch of functions like declared in, in, um, in, the, bin, in the binary. Um, so we can start to make sense to start to, like to to analyze the the binary itself. So the problem is uh, now we are looking for malloc and free. Uh, and the problem is we sometimes have hundreds to thousands of functions uh, recognized. So this is like more like um, like looking for a needle in a haystack. Uh, and doing this like by hand is like super tedious. It's like it, it, it's insane. So we need like some technique to uh, automatize this process. So the first intuition is uh, memory allocators generate pointers. That's their job. And these pointers are it's in some way like eventually used to perform some memory operations. Um, so the question is who is using memory pointers? Um, and turns out this function, uh, the basic function I mentioned at the beginning, are consumers. So they receive a pointer and they do something in memory uh, to perform like uh, an action. So mem copy, like copy is like a source, buff um, source buffer to the destination buffer, mem set just set like a specific constant. And turns out that because of this very simple behavior, uh, they are very simple to identify. Um, that's why we call them basic function indeed. And just to give you an example, uh, if you want to spot for mem copy, we just grab some functions. We've pre-filtered some function in the binary with some syntactical features. And we are like, OK, um, I, I think that F8 is a mem copy. And I want to see if uh, by setting the input x, y, and z to these specific values, uh, I can observe the behavior of a mem copy. So we just emulate the function with these three parameters. And then we ask ourselves, uh, does the buffer at x, so the buffer at the destination, contain exactly nine bytes? And the buffer at the source is unchanged. And sorry, and the destination buffer, of course, should contain the, uh, the source buffer. If, it, if the answer is yes, then we tag this function as a mem copy. And we have different like models that we use to check for like a multitude of different like uh, basic functions. So we go from this uh, to this situation where we have some uh, basic function uh, in memory, in, sorry, in the binary. And we can also see this function as like sinks and thinking that like pointers are flowing inside these sinks and are consumed over there. So this is our first hook uh, to start to um, discover malloc and free, because the next step is where are the sources? Um, the sources are all the functions that are like in some way providing argument to the basic function. So are providing like a, an address that is flowing inside the sink over here. Uh, and in this case, the sink is a mem copy. And you can see that F19 is creating like B25 that flows inside mem copy. So this is like F19 is going to be like um, a valid basic uh, pointer source 
Um, to do this, uh, we put together a, a static taint engine based on reaching definition, and turns out that we scale very well uh, over these like uh, even big blobs. Uh, it's easy to interconnect all the static definition, even like interprocedurally, uh, to understand if uh, eventually a, a basic function is consuming or like as an argument defined by uh, the return value of another function. So we stitch together this analysis like interprocedurally and we collect all the functions that are returning values that define these arguments. So in this case, um, V25 is going to have the static definition F19 return, and this is the, the hint that uh, this is flowing inside our sink. So F19 becomes a pointer source now. So now we have the sink and we have the sources. Um, the intuition is a memory allocator, as I said, are indeed pointer sources. That's their job. However, uh, we can have many pointer sources uh, identified. So again, like looking into them manually sometimes is very tedious. You don't want to do it. So we want to identify malloc and be able to execute it. And like because at the end of the day, we want to do some security checks. So we need to be able to execute it uh, precisely. So how to identify malloc? So the first intuition is malloc returns pointers inside the heap region. And thankfully, this is like standardized in, um, um, in Cortex-M. And this is falling between like these two addresses. Uh, so we can uh, use this uh, to, to, to check if uh, the return value of, uh, of an invocation to like a, a function is returning values inside this range. And um, also malloc returns different addresses to subsequent invocation simply because we want to serve every um, every request with different like memory blocks. So um, that being said, we take a pointer source and we dereference it and we get all the call site and we grab one of the arguments at the call site and we try to call the pointer source multiple times obtaining different addresses. And for every address we obtain, we check, first of all, if the address is inside the heap memory, so the known range we, um, we discussed like earlier. And second, if this is different from the previous addresses we observe. If we can answer yes to both questions, we say that PS, the pointer source, is a candidate malloc. So now we have um, these two, for example, candidate malloc uh, identified like in the blob. Um, we need to find three. So malloc and free in our like research scope um, are like working in pair uh, because we want to observe like the allocated chunk being reallocated at some point. So um, yeah, in other words, malloc at some point returns the, the last freed pointer. So uh, to spot for free, uh, we first select uh, again some like candidates inside our uh, inside our blob uh, using some again syntactical features of the and properties of the function, and then we pair every candidate malloc with every candidate free, and we call the candidate malloc an x amount of times. For example, here I call it three times, and I obtain three addresses. I register those addresses. And I feed them inside the candidate free one by one, basically uh, simulating like freeing the, the pointers. And then I call the candidate malloc again to see if it matches one of the addresses we observed before. If it's yes, this is a valid pair. And we call this the heap management library, the HML of the uh, binary blob. So we went from this um, like unknown like space of like function, we don't know what they do to uh, finally this, uh, in which we can point to malloc and free in the binary, so we found our needles in the haystack. Um, to evaluate the uh, identification of um, this HML within the binaries, we first of all put together like um, a ground truth data set uh, with more or less, no, actually with 20 monolithic firmware images collected from previous research uh, being done on the, in the space. And once everything looked good, so our system was able to point to malloc and free because for these binaries, we actually had uh, symbols. So we can say, okay, uh, hipster found malloc at address X and ad check him manually that uh, malloc is address X. So when everything looked good, we uh, scale our analysis to uh, this other data set that has been recently published. Um, I don't remember where, but it was like a, I think CCS. Um, 
So it contains like 799 monolithic firmware images for which you, do, you don't know anything. It's just like a bunch of blobs, uh, no symbols, and we don't know where they're coming from. It's just like wild. That's why it's called wild. Um, and these are like, um, this is the classification the guys did in their paper. Um, there are like a lot of wearable um, uh, binary blobs. And this is a very heterogeneous like data set. Uh, this is a very diverse um, like data set with like blobs coming from different um, applications. So uh, we found with Ipster that 340 of them, they use a dynamic memory allocator. And this is like about 42%. And this number doesn't look that exciting if you consider it just yeah, as 42%, it's not a big deal. But if you consider the amount of pushbacks there is from the embedded developer community uh, to not use the dynamic allocator inside firmware images, that's becoming actually an interesting number because it's saying that, it's saying that nearly half of them were actually using one uh, dynamic allocator which is, again, strongly, strongly like, discouraged by uh, the embedded developing community. So it turns out it was an interesting result. Um, we found around 10 different HML families, so 10 different like uh, allocators in 32 different variations. And I want to expand a little bit on this concept of families and variations. Um, first of all, to detect a family, we grab two uh, identified mallocs uh, implementation with their call graph and the function that they call. And we check for the family if the body of uh, the implementation of the malloc number one, how similar it is to the second uh, malloc implementation. So we do some binary similarity using bin diff. Um, if the result is like greater than 0 0.7, which is a constant we found out through some trial and error and see uh, by checking manually when the constant was actually making sense. There are some false positives and some like trade off you have to do to pick a good one, but 0 0.7 turned out to, to work like pretty well. Um, if this happens, we call this um, to be part of the same family. And so we can create clusters of uh, similar allocators. Uh, so for instance, here you can say uh, A uh, contains this amount of like allocators and B, well, the same amount, but yeah, you can define clusters in, uh, in our data set. And this is for the family. Um, for the variants, the variants, they should take into account like um, different versions, different options, customization from the developers. So the idea is we grab all the functions that are like part of the allocator and we check the binary similarity of all of them. And if all of them are like um, binary similar, like with a score equal to one, so a perfect match, there is no variant. I mean, they represent like the same library with the same option, like perfect match. So. Instead, if there is like um, no perfect match, some function like called at some point in the, in the allocator are different, we call this to be a variant. Of course, this is not like super, super precise, but um, it gives you like a rough like estimate of uh, how many uh, diversities out there. So uh, we go from these macro clusters we just created and we define some um, micro, uh, Macro and micro clusters now. Uh, for example, A, you have like A1 and A2, and B, B1 and B2. So here are like, these are the same variants and part of the same family. When you run the uh, analysis over our data set, you obtain something like this. Um, you can clearly see that there is like a couple of allocators like being used a lot. And this contains around like three variants. So people are not really customizing it a lot or yeah, um, maybe people are just like taking the library and using it. While this data set, uh, if I remember correctly, was the one with the most variants. So people seem to customize a lot this allocator. Um, there are also some like outliers over there uh, and we check them manually. And it seems that no other binary like Edan and HML was similar to these guys. So these are like kind of the inspiration of the title of the presentation, hipster, because those are like hipster implementation of the heap. Uh, <laughs> Um, all right, so now we want to do um, security testing because we are like security guys. Um, so the first thing I want to make clear is we want to divide between heap exploitation primitives and heap vulnerable state. Uh, heap exploitation primitive is like the common vulnerabilities you heard about. So heap overflow is after free, double free, and fake free or arbitrary free. 
while vulnerable states are states in which the locator can be, that we define as corrupted. Uh, so overlapping chunks, chunks are overlapping, so you're mixing data from uh, that different data structures, pretty bad. Uh, out of heap allocations, you can like arbitrarily like allocate a chunk in some like arbitrary point in memory, which is very bad. And finally, restricted and arbitrary write, so you can trigger a very nice uh, write what were primitive or like that the same thing, but in some restricted form. So for example, you cannot control all the other space. Um, so yeah, these are the corrupted state that we are talking about. And to move forward, I want to use this metaphor in which I want to see the heap exploitation primitives as bombs that you can throw to the HML to observe explosions. And usually um, the bombs are the application fault, so it's a firmware bug. And the explosion are the HML fault, because the HML was not preventing a bomb to create an explosion. Sometimes if the library is hardened, uh, you can actually dodge the bomb and uh, miss the explosion, right? Um, so yeah, we, for, for our security check, we assume we have bombs and we just want to observe explosions. So, and the question we ask is, can we reach a heap vulnerable state using a heap exploitation primitives? Given bombs, can we see explosions? To do this, we built on top of Heap Hopper, uh, and it was quite an engineering task because Heap Hopper was meant to work on um, this kind of system, so in which you can point out to the Heap library and say, okay, I want to analyze this guy, and you can extract it and analyze it like in, in a standalone way. So it was quite a challenge to adapt it to uh, analyze like blobs, uh, because you cannot really extract the HTML from the blob. It's like, we tried, but it was not working. So um, we had to adapt the popper to perform this task. Um, the first thing we do is to generate like POCs, and a POC is um, a program that contains like multiple calls to the, uh, to the HTML API. So over here you can see we uh, call malloc free malloc, then we inject the bomb, and then free. So this generator is just creating like many, many, many POCs. And we call it POCs because it's like a, um, a proof of concept, the acronym, but in other words, it's like a proof of interaction with the heap that can lead to eventually a proof of vulnerability if uh, we found a, a problem in the allocator. So we generate the POCs, we compile them, and then we loaded them inside the popper. The popper is based on anger, so that's why there is the smile. Um, so we load them in a popper and we also side loaded the firmware and we hook the calls to malloc and free from the POC to be redirected inside the firmware itself. So whenever we are executing this, uh, symbolically tracing the POC, we are going to end up executing the real malloc of the firmware and then going back and executing the free and so on and so forth, like progressing the state of the heap uh, at every uh, action. Just a little bit of more of details uh, on how ePopper works and our system works. So we start from a state S1, consider this like the state of the heap. Everything, nothing has been done now, uh, no action has, has been done, no, no malloc, no free, nothing. And we call a malloc, so conceptually we go to state two. And then we go to state three with another malloc, and at some point the heap memory looks like, I don't know, something like this, like a couple of chunks in memory with some data. Um, at this point, the POC is like calling the bomb, so in this case, an overflow. And this means that we are injecting symbolic variables in memory, and this is simulating an overflow on the first chunk. Then we go ahead with other actions until we can observe a vulnerable state. Um, and as a vulnerable state here, I mean, um, when I call malloc at this point, I can observe malloc is returning a symbolic value, so I ask myself, can I concretize this value to be out of the heap to like arrange uh, an address that doesn't fall in the range I show you at the beginning? If yes, we start the POV generation. Um, to do this, we just go back in memory and we concretize all the symbolic variables to have a concrete value now in order to be able to allocate that chunk out of the heap. And so we go from a POC that contains symbolic values, symbolic like uh, information, to a POV that can give me the concretization of, for example, the call to the malloc I have to do in order to observe the out of heap allocation. And this is our, yeah, again, proof of vulnerability. So um, for the security testing, again, consider this like um, big picture. We extract 32 unique HTML representatives from each cluster. 
um, just to avoid to rep uh, repeat test that we shouldn't do it just because I mean we're, we are going to test the same implementation otherwise and we don't want to waste energy. Um, so 32 unique HTML. Um, this is how it looks like. Um, the result is none of the tested HTML was preventing uh, was like properly completely hardened. Uh, for instance, you can see that we can trigger for 100% of the HTML an overlapping chunk when using an heap overflow. And heap overflow turns out to be, I mean, a very powerful primitive, just because everyone like simply was using heap cookies, uh, sorry, heap um, inline metadata, and not using heap cookies to prevent this to happen. So, yeah, very powerful primitive, like the use after free. Um, another interesting like um, detail in this graph is the double free seems to be useful to trigger overlapping chunk. Uh, for less than 75% uh, of the firmware, but not useful for, to trigger the other vulnerable state. But yeah, takeaway point is all the HML that we tested were like vulnerable to at least one exploitation primitive, and we, we can observe uh, a vulnerable state. So now you may wonder, um, what about the feasibility of POV? You can tell me, uh, Fabio, but you just emulate everything. Are these POV like actually can happen in the firmware? So we try to answer this question. And so given a POV, like the one I showed you before, um, the question is, can I observe this flow in the, in, the, in the binary, in the firmware image? Because I told you we assumed the bombs, so the POC, they were containing the bomb, but is the binary containing the bombs? Um, and turns out this is like an extremely uh, difficult challenge uh, if you don't have re-hosting technology to dynamically execute the firmware. Um, so what we can do is uh, try to answer this question statically, uh, and we try by defining two properties. The first property is, can I reach a call to malloc from function that read data from MMIO regions? So assuming that this function is reading data from, uh, from the external world, we don't know it because we don't know which are the function like precise of all the firmware we have that are reading data from the user. But we can assume like to over approximate that all the functions that are reading through a specific address space that is um, reserved for MMIO are reading like data from the external board. So again, over approximation, but um, this is what we have. So let's say we receive the envelope. We want to see MMIO function at some point calls a malloc. So there is a flow from MMIO to malloc. And then we want to observe a flow from a malloc to a mem copy with a not constant size. So this is trying to catch uh, statically uh, the behavior of a possible heap overflow. So you receive data from, mem from, from the external world, you malloc stuff, and then you have a mem copy that copy a variable size that potentially can be more than 10. So by using these two properties, uh, we get all our data set and of firmware that are containing an HML, and we filter them uh, to select some candidates for manual inspection. Yeah, we did manual inspection at the end. And we filter out 54 uh, of those firmware, and it took about a week to me and Ilya over here <laughs> to go over them. Uh, and we found like four of them containing valid exploitation primitives. So uh, we could have like uh, created like a, P a valid POV uh, when using these exploitation primitives. It's not a great number, but additional research must, research must be done for sure to answer this question. And I'm aware that like a couple of very good papers are like, they just came out um, at, at the last like uh, academic conferences to build further that are able to answer this question in a dynamic way. Um, as a final like uh, step, we want to know that, again, like everything we did was in an emulator. So we kind of want to know if what we did translated to the physical world. So uh, we grabbed one of the boards we had in the lab and we were curious to know that uh, if um, the HML uh, that the HML of the binary that is flashed on the board was vulnerable to anything, and if we could have confirmed the attack like um, practically on the board itself. So what we did, we developed an application that uses malloc and free, um, using the embed studio online. It was an STM32 like board. Um, and the compiler just selected automatically without us telling anything the HML to include in the firmware itself. So the library to include to perform the malloc and free. Then we dump the binary and we run hipster over it and we detect like possible attacks. Uh, so possible vulnerable state being reached by using, if I remember like overflow and use after free. 
So we tried to confirm these attacks on the board, and we were able to, uh, to say by looking at the logs that actually chunks were allocating out of the heap. Sometimes the board was just like panicking uh, because we were allocating probably in some reserved region that were not supposed to be written. But yeah, other times we can, we can observe overlapping chunks, so being able to corrupt data structure of different uh, part of the application that we developed. So yeah, it worked. Uh, we had like a good reality check saying this is like good. All right, so let me go through some conclusions. Um, this is the current state of the discussion, and library developers are generally pointing to the application developer, saying that they are misusing the API of the, of the heap, so that's their fault if these like, problems are out there. Application developers are pointing back, saying, no, but you should harden your library because, I mean, this, you should raise the bar. And then with the disaster, uh, security researcher blaming both of them because apparently the situation is not getting fixed, so we kind of try to yell at everyone. Um, few takeaways before I conclude. Uh, first of all, um, this is one of the most interesting like finding. Uh, dynamic memory allocators are used in monolithic firmware images more than what people would expect. Um, I think this is a very interesting finding, again, considering the amount of pushbacks that there is uh, from the <coughs> embedded developer. Um, there are like quite different and unique implementation out there. Um, this is another like interesting finding. Like sometimes people are coming up with like new EP implementation from scratch, just because they feel like the the current one are not good enough. Maybe from a performance point of view, they want something better, and then they screw up the security. And finally, um, the IoT attack surface is, is like already huge, um, expanding every year. So uh, this is quite, um, um, you know, yesterday someone says like sci-fi uh, kind, of, kind of attacks. And I know that like right now um, the, the biggest concern is like, I don't know, default credentials for IoT. Uh, it's not like corruption of like heap memories, but I would like this uh, attack surface to stay out of the agenda of those, um, of those like, um, let's say CISO, uh, CISO uh, and these people. So I would really like the community to do something right now uh, to avoid in the future to have like uh, bigger problems and having all these devices out there vulnerable to these memory corruption attacks. And I'm aware that some vendors like Qualcomm, I know, uh, I was part of some conversation last summer when I was an intern here. Uh, they are already trying to uh, fix this issue and they're like interested in knowing how to prevent um, for example, like heap overflows to, um, to corrupt the heap, uh, the heap state. Uh, all right, more details are like in our like SMP paper. I simplified a lot like over here because there were like ton of technical details, but if you're interested, you can check it out. And everything is open source, uh, this link on GitHub. And if you need like support, you can just, uh, I hang out in the anger like Slack channel. So I'm very active there. You can ping me there or shoot me an email or on Twitter. Um, yeah. That was my time. Thank you so much.